20 women on a quest to find true flavor. You marry me. Yes! For a white or black girl? A white girl. White girls. White. 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 They gon' listen. You went from a black woman to a white woman without having to take that Hispanic woman step in between. <laughs> Rachel is the total package. She's the triple threat, brains, beauty, personality. I want to know that a girl can keep my house clean. Would you date a bus driver? You date if he owns the bus. If he owns no. it. If he owns the bus. See, that's a problem. That's a problem. Don't you know that a man being rich is like a girl being pretty? 50 women will compete to marry a mystery multimillionaire. She won't meet him till they say, I do. I like to do a lot of fun things that do require money, like shopping for diamonds, traveling first class. Probably would not date somebody who is blue collar. But a man earning the kind of money you're talking about does not go for an average looking woman. You're average looking at best. Keep it real, I got tired of seeing the names Micah, Kwame, and Marshall on my timeline with no explanation. I was like, who the fuck are these people? They are cast members of season four of Netflix's mega smash hit, Love is Blind. The show places desperate singles in pods and lets them talk to each other through speakers with the end goal of getting engaged and ultimately married. Along with these names, I've seen recurring criticism about the ways in which black women fare on dating shows. Bits of controversy from the show those final episodes and reunion led me to research and write this video, especially because I'm working on a larger piece about black women in reality TV. Because the last dating shows I watched were the VH1 ones I consumed as a youth, I thought it would be interesting to watch a season of The Bachelorette and Love is Blind as an adult and rewatch Flavor of Love. While the shows weren't that interesting, Love is Blind was egregiously overlong and The Bachelorette nearly bored me to tears, what I've researched is fascinating because this video was originally supposed to be 20 minutes. I fully admit reality TV is very contrived and mostly fake. It's still a reflection of reality, and in a country where approximately 130 million adults read below a sixth grade level and 52% of Americans watch at least one hour of reality TV a week, visual media can be a powerful shaper of values and beliefs. What's the history of reality dating shows? What do dating shows reflect and project about black women's real life desirability? How are dating shows exploitative and manipulative? What's with all these rush to the altar shows. In this video, we'll be talking about finding love on reality TV, hypergamy, and black women's desirability by examining the phenomenons of The Bachelor, Flavor of Love, and Love is Blind, and some scandals and trivia along the way. Again, shout out to this video's sponsor, Beducated. For my longtime viewers, you already know about Beducated. From my past videos on a black woman's history of burlesque and history videos on oral sex and masturbation, Beducated is committed to inclusive and expert based knowledge about your sexual wellness and journey. While we'll be talking about romantic love in this video, primarily through a black woman's perspective, it's masturbation may over on Beducated. One of the things that gives me confidence in dating and in my romantic relationships is knowing that the way I love and take care of myself sets the bar for who I entertain. Plus, knowing what I like in bed makes it easier to teach a new partner what I like in bed. We should all prioritize our own personal well-being and nurture our self-esteem and have the language to do so. Self-love is the most premium kind of love there is, and Beducated can help you tap in. And I'm not just talking about slinging your jelly or slinging your juice. In addition to thorough courses on navigating your self-pleasure journey and having vulva orgasms, there are courses on building your sexual confidence, sexual healing, and taking control of your libido. I'm also a fan of the Kegel Mojo course, which offers complete details on strengthening your core and pelvic floor. So what are you waiting for? Go touch yourself. Not only for the rest of the month can you get 50% off the yearly pass with my coupon code Lexus, but you can try all Beducated courses, and there are over a hundred of them for one day day free. Yes, free. You won't get charged for the first 24 hours and you can cancel anytime. There's no risk with a 14 day money back guarantee. Use the link in my description box and tell them Alexis sent you.
Dating shows have been around in some form or the other since the days of radio, but started on TV in the 1960s. There was The Dating Game, which premiered in 1965. Both shows were a similar format to Love is Blind. Contestants were hidden from sight while a potential partner vetted their personality before a date. The Dating Game would air until 1999 and became a cultural touchstone, utilized in sitcoms and parodied. The novelty of dating on TV was still so fresh that the gimmick wasn't an instant marriage. You were just meeting total strangers. Well, let's see. Baxter number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. Infamously, a serial killer named Rodney Alcala appeared on the dating game in 1978 while he was in the midst of killing people, which shows how little contestants were vetted. He had been convicted of raping a child in 1968, and the show still introduced him as an eligible bachelor and photographer who enjoyed skydiving or motorcycling. The woman he won the date with refused to go out with him because she correctly surmised he was creepy and he continued on to kill more people before being arrested in 1979. This wasn't the last time a killer would end up on a dating show, nor would it stop the hunger for this entertainment. In 1983, Love Connection debuted and ran in its original format until 1994 and has been brought back multiple times. Love Connection would even dangle the offer of a $10,000 cash prize to contest Distance. From the beginning, these shows included a sense of comedy that signaled that they weren't meant to be taken all that seriously. Many of the people who appeared on these dating shows were actors or models actively trying to break into Hollywood and TV, backed up by the fact that several Love Connection clips on YouTube have been uploaded by former actors and models. These dating shows were often career stepping stones of exposure, not to be taken seriously. They were as popular as any other game show like Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune because they were competition and humans, we love watching competition. Another popular and non-serious dating show to emerge during this era was Blind Date, which premiered in 1999. But sadly for these reality show contestants, there was no social media fame waiting at the end of their appearances. From the original 1999 to 2006 run of Blind Date, a total of two couples eventually married after the show. But by the 2000s, dating shows were in for an infusion of gimmicks and desperation, especially as networks looked to fund cheap reality shows over expensive scripted ones. During the presidency of George W. Bush, there was intense debate over the sanctity of marriage, especially after Massachusetts ruled that denying marriage rights to gay couples violated their constitution. It became the first state to license and recognize same-sex marriage, spurning conservative backlash about the importance of reserving marriage for men and women. While these battles raged on, marriage was being pimped on primetime television. Television. First, there was Who Wants to Marry a Multi-Millionaire, playing off of the newly popular Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. When it aired on February 15, 2000 in a two-hour special, over 22 million households tuned in, but not without intense criticism in the months before and after. Wrote a disgusted columnist, 50 female contestants vied for the honor of marrying a man they had never seen. All they knew about him was that he's really rich and he's weird enough to wed a stranger whose only interest in him is monetary. The columnist added, for centuries it was parents, not TV networks, who arranged marriages. Others likened the series to green lighting sex work. But there was a problem with the multi-millionaire bachelor who Fox claimed had $750,000 in liquid assets and a $2 million net worth. Not only was Rick Rockwell a struggling comedian not making nearly a million a year, but his ex-girlfriend had filed a restraining order against him for violent behavior. Next Entertainment, the producers, reported that they had no way of finding the restraining order because of a Fair Credit Reporting Act loophole. Darva Conger, a 35-year-old emergency department nurse, was the winner of the show, and she was upset when he forcibly kissed her on stage. The two were immediately married and sent on a honeymoon to Barbados, where the marriage went unconsummated. 
Upon their return, Conger immediately got an annulment and sold her engagement ring. When she posed for Playboy shortly after her appearance on the show, she was dragged in the media. While Fox never went forward with another season of the show, they, like other networks, wanted to scale back big budget productions for reality TV. And Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire was just the beginning. Fox followed it up with Temptation Island, which threw couples on an island with tons of alcohol and other couples to test their loyalties. It wasn't a popular concept that drew out many couples. While Fox had 6,000 applicants for the first season of Survivor, for instance, there were only 250 applicants for Temptation Island. So in 2002, producer Mark Fleiss brought The Bachelor to life. Monday, March 25th, ABC presents the classic story of boy meets girl, 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 meets girl. Boy picks one girl to hopefully become his wife. The Bachelor. It retained the competitive spirit of Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire, but became much more about romance and aligned with middle class values. It is the longest running and most popular dating show and has created its own lane of niche celebrity for a committed group of fans called Bachelor Nation. Throughout the show's run, however, it's been very white. Though black women and other minorities have been added as background filler throughout the show's run, they always got eliminated early on. After a failed discrimination suit against the producers in 2012 by black men upset that they weren't cast in the lead roles, producers sprinkled in more minorities like Parsley. Not that it changed much. A 2016 Splinter study found that 59% of black contestants up to that point were kicked off of the show in the first two weeks. Salon found that in 31 seasons, of The Bachelor and the spin-off The Bachelorette, only four winners could partially claim white ancestry, and all were biracial and Asian. The first black lead of The Bachelorette was Rachel Lindsay, a lawyer and daughter of a U.S. District Court judge who had made it in the final three during her season of The Bachelor. The move was cheered on in the industry as black women finally getting representation on the long whitewash show. While a 2015 study says black women are 59% more likely to watch reality TV than other women, and a 2014 study said black women watch 14 more hours a week of TV, 80% of The Bachelor and Bachelorette viewership is white. So during Rachel Lindsay's season in 2017, viewership plummeted during the premiere and for the rest of the season. And we gonna be coming back to Miss Rachel Lindsay. Two years after The Bachelor premiered in 2002, Bush announced that he supported a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage, right before kicking off his successful re-election campaign. Though they would zero in on gays and lesbians who desired marriage, conservatives and homophobes who could watch shows like Who Wants to Marry a Multi-Millionaire and The Bachelor were cool with marriage being for TV ratings and profit. And why wouldn't they be? Most serious dating shows showcase heterosexuality, typical gender roles, hypergamy or marrying or forming a sexual relationship with a person of a superior sociological or educational background, and or capitalist rituals of love, like lavish gifts and travel. Of course, any show that makes love and near instantaneous marriage between heterosexual couples its primary objective has misogynistic implications and overtures. When Flavor of Love appeared on VH1 in March 2006, it was touted by some as The Black Bachelor. But as many of us who first watched the series unfold on screen will tell you, there were major glaring differences. First, I don't think anybody watching seriously believed any woman competing wanted to marry Flav, except maybe Tiffany Pollard, I'm not gonna hold you. Secondly, Flav, real name William Drayton, took the women's names and replaced them with objectifications like Boots, Delicious, and Nibbles. But hey, you know, I was looking to see who had the softest chest. I like soft chest. Next, explained producer Mark Cronin, I produced Flavor of Love, a show on VH1, in which 20 women competed to date the public enemy hype man Flavor Flav. Those women believed he was rich, after all, he was famous, and that they were living in his mansion. In fact, he was not long out of jail for not paying parking tickets. He had very little income. We rented the mansion from a nice family in Encino. On The Bachelor and Bachelorette, there's travel, lavish dates, and a big ass budget. Meanwhile, VH1 had the Flavor women squatting four to six to a room and had them going to work. Ah, home at last. Whereas 
is The Bachelors, where gainfully employed, middle class to upper class men, perpetuating white Christian heteronormativity and talking about how much they cherish their families and desired commitment and romance, Flav was the first hype man in hip hop, a part of revolutionary group Public Enemy, with a lengthy arrest record and eight children. By the time of the 2000s, he was more known for appearing in VH1 Surreal Life and getting into an entanglement with Brigitte Nielsen, an actress and ex-wife of Sylvester Stallone. Their relationship was toxic to say the least and would prove to be a gold mine for VH1. When Flavor of Love debuted, some viewed it as the Black Bachelor and others viewed it as a former revolutionary artist and sellout becoming a minstrel act. And the show had number one ratings with Black Americans aged 18 to 45. Seriously, everybody was talking about the show when it first dropped. Adding to the minstrelsy allegations were the activities the women were made to perform in challenges from dining them at KFC to making them take care of kids to working at restaurants to entertaining his friends to most egregiously having them clean up the filthy leftovers of a house party at Warren G's mansion. Man, I was cleaning Warren G house dog. And that's going to hold the fort down when I ain't around, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know. I want a woman that's going to be a queen just as much as I am a king. Class. And that's going to do her thing right. around the ring. Yeah. Even when I stop to sing, you know what I mean? Yeah, that surreal. makes mad sense. That makes mad no, sense. Surreal, boo. Is it in you? The mostly black cast was reduced to house servant, nanny, and maid. Said Flav, I want to know that a girl can keep my house clean. This is extremely different from The Bachelor, where there are lavish dates as well as less demeaning challenges. All of this matters because white viewers who don't know black people in real life often accept these reality shows as the norm. By the same token, the white version of the show, Rock of Love, would reinforce stereotypes about lower class white women. Another horrible thing I noticed about Flavor of Love was that the women were expected to kiss and often have sex to stay in the house. Flav kicked out Tiger in season two for not kissing him and later Boots for claiming to be celibate. Additionally, the women of Flavor of Love didn't have the same expectations of privacy as Bachelor women, as Flav was regularly seen walking in and out of their rooms and even in the bathrooms as they showered. Lastly, because of the status of Flav, his past instances of domestic violence as well as his drug problems and squad of children, the women themselves were seen as trashy. In reviews of the show, the women, many of whom were aspiring actresses, singers, video vixens, or actual sex workers, were dragged as being equally matched for Flav. Even the white women, I'm looking at you, the racist pumpkin and the culturally appropriating buck wild. Ew, and I ain't forget you, Apple. I thought I might not fit in with the other women. I wasn't sure how ghetto some people might be. And they weren't seen as prizes. All of them were dragged mercilessly along with Flav during 2007's The Comedy Central Roast of Flavor Flav, though they did get a D-list category of fame that allowed them networking and career opportunities and further casting on VH1 shows. The first season finale of Flavor of Love brought in nearly six million viewers, making it the highest rated program for VH1. On the sister channel, MTV, non-serious dating shows like Next, Room Raiders, and Parental Control were also airing. BT, the black entertainment television channel, wasn't really interested in cornering the market on black dating shows because all they gave us was Hell Date, which was a prank show, and it was awful, but the popularity of Flavor of Love, which was palpable in my youth, changed the TV landscape forever. First of all, it would lead to a shift in more black people starring in reality shows of all genres. Networks now saw big money when black people were involved. Secondly, it spawned a celebrity dating show universe for VH1, including two direct sequels, multiple spinoffs starring Tiffany New York Pollard, a white version, Rock of Love, starring washed up rock star Brett Michaels, For the Love of Ray J, Real Chance of Love, MTV's A Shot of Love with Tila Tequila, notable for being the first series with a bisexual and Asian American lead, and eventually Megan Wants a Millionaire in 2009. We'll be coming back to New York and Charm School in an upcoming video, but there are a couple of things to say about Megan Wants a Millionaire, starring Megan Hauserman, who appeared on Rock of Love and Rock of Love Charm School and got doused with a drink by a hypocritical Sharon Osbourne. First, it's interesting and telling to me that New York's show was filled with 
average men and wannabe actors who stood to benefit from her fame and connections. Remember Frank the Entertainer who lived in his parents' basement? They set her up with him. Meanwhile, Megan's show was mostly verified millionaires whose goal was to turn her into a trophy wife. Pergamy has always been a contentious subject in the black community, and it's looked at differently for white women, who have been more easily able to move between classes via marriage. Hypergamy has been explored in literature and film like Becky Sharp in Vanity Fair, who was an anti-heroine to the 20th century heroines in the movies Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and How to Marry a Millionaire. No, honestly. Have you got the nerve to stand there and expect me to believe that you don't want to marry my son for his money? It's true. Then what do you want to marry him for? I want to marry him for your money. Fair. Don't you know that a man being rich is like a girl being pretty? You might not marry a girl just because she's pretty, but my goodness, doesn't it help? And if you had a daughter, wouldn't you rather she didn't marry a poor man? But I was... You'd want her to have the most wonderful things in the world and to be very happy. Oh, why is it wrong for me to want those things? Though, to be clear, both the black and white upper classes usually marry within their own class, reserving successful hypergamy for the most conventionally attractive beneficiaries of the patriarchy in the orbit of supremely wealthy men, i.e. celebrities, models, etc not average women. Fox executives made fun of hypergamous average women in their 2003 show, Joe Millionaire, by having a group of women compete for a man they believed to be a millionaire, but who was actually a construction worker. The show made fun of their hypergamous desires and raked in cash for Fox. For the Americans watching, the joke was these women being open gold diggers for a man with no gold. So clearly, hypergamy has never been accessible to all white women, but it still happens, and it's increasing a dating style some women subscribe to. In the black community, calls for black women to only date up have been getting stronger, in defiance of traditional notions that we should resist being gold diggers. Poor misguided souls on TikTok have advised women to engage in a remix of sex worker fishing, eating in restaurants, and attempting to get random men to pay for their meals. Shit like that. That's, that's, mm. They're trying to manifest their own millionaire or billionaire, often off the strength of of repeated stories that include the rapper and actress Eve, who used to be a stripper marrying a billionaire, Kamora Lee Simmons, who at 17 began dating her future ex-husband, 35-year-old multi-millionaire Russell Simmons, and Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, or Lauren Sanchez snagging multi-billionaire Jeff Bezos. But all of these women had vast social and or erotic capital, as well as being relatively wealthy in their own right before they got these men. Recently, there have been arguments over a formerly poor woman turned celeb dating a rich basketball player, rapper, or in the case of Carisha Young Miami Brownlee, dating millionaire Sean Diddy Combs about whether or not it's true hypergamy. It depends on who you ask. The line between what constitutes sex work and what constitutes hypergamy is thin and usually comes in the form of a wedding ring, nuptials, and an advantageous or non-existent prenup. Strict hypergamists have their eyes on men who come from old and or professional money, not knowing these are the ones least likely to marry out. Before feminism, women who sought to marry up were more likely to be seen as devious. But in the 20th century, as shown in those movies I mentioned earlier, depending on the financial care of a man was presented as a more traditional and correct route than a woman making her own money and being independent. But it was repackaged as a tremendous privilege. When the second wave of feminism from the late 60s and 70s called for economic independence and political and social equality. It caused anti-feminists like Phyllis Schlafly to oppose the Equal Rights Amendment on the basis that it would take away women's privileges of being stay-at-home wives and mothers. These are many of the same women who would oppose reparations, regulating banks that peddle loans to black families, and supported their male husbands' agendas to deny justice and financial equity to black people. So the modern trad wife or traditional traditional wife movement being mostly pushed by white women who desire to be stay-at-home wives and mothers showcases the glaring difference between white and black women's histories. The trad life has often been denied black women, who have been working in some capacity since first being enslaved in this country in 1619. Consider this. 
In 1880, 35.4% of married black women and 73.3% of single black women were in the labor force, compared with only 7.3% of married white women and 23.8% of single white women. And often in the past, those traditional wives depended on the labor of black women. When black women desire a traditional marriage with a financially secure man who pays the bills, she's usually seen as a gold digger, lazy and or unrealistic. To a degree, it is unrealistic to think that we can all have ballers. Because of racial wealth inequality, there are less black men who can offer the kinds of lifestyles highly coveted on social media. You know, being flewed out on private jets, taking on private trips, limousines and getting bought a Tesla for your birthday or just cause it's Tuesday and walking into a room with hella flowers and hella money everywhere and stuff. Yeah, not everybody's getting that. After all, just 30 to 31% of black households make over $75,000 a year. Just 20% make over 100,000. And because of inequities in housing, banking and business, we know that isn't the same $100,000 white people make. But let me emphasize, black women aren't villains for desiring financial stability, equally matched partners, or even a partner who pays all the bills. That shouldn't be controversial, but I'm sure my comments are gonna say otherwise. So it wasn't surprising that New York, the queen of 2000s reality TV, was simply looking for love, and then she got sent literally to work in spinoffs after the fact, while Megan got to fill the role of a blonde trophy in Megan Wants a Millionaire. But the show wouldn't pay off much for VH1. Before the entire series could air, a contestant named Ryan Jenkins, who placed third in the show, married a model named Jasmine Fiore in Vegas after two days of dating. Within months, there were pending charges of domestic violence against him, and he eventually murdered her and killed himself. VH1 stopped airing Megan Wants a Millionaire when the news broke and canceled plans to run season three of I Love Money, which Jenkins won. But it also came to light that Jenkins had been convicted two years earlier for assaulting a woman in Canada. VH1 had hired a private investigation firm to do background checks on all the contestants, and a Canadian firm they outsourced to never brought up his conviction. VH1 dodged legal accountability, but as a blogger pointed out, the network has built a brand on unstable crazy people interacting on these idiotic and mindless dating shows and can't pretend to not have anything to do with it. The tidal wave of VH1 celebrity dating shows and the I Love Money and Charm School editions that all mutated from Flavor of Love came to an end, but the dating show would again evolve. First of all, the renewed importance of stringent background checks and exhaustive mental evaluations would make filming these shows safer, but it also armed production with explosive tea that can and is used to trigger contestants for good ratings. Next, the celebrity dating show became passe. The dating shows of the early 2010s reflected the post-2009 recession world, featuring average people, but with more gimmicks in a country increasingly dominated by social media. Though there were a few small sad exceptions like Ultimate Merger in which Donald Trump picked 12 men, an all black mix of wannabes, entrepreneurs, and I'll be sure, for the Apprentice star Omarosa Manigault to date. Omarosa chose nobody from the cast and Takara Jones from America's Next Top Model starred in the next and final season. Does anybody remember this show? Letting Donald Trump play matchmaker for you is absolutely wild, it couldn't be me. In 2014, Married at First Sight debuted on Lifetime. Average people, not celebrities or wannabe actors, were set up with strangers by a panel of experts. With 14 couples eventually marrying and still being together today over 11 seasons, the show has a 20% success rate. I'm gonna warn you guys now, this next segment might piss a few people off. If you're one of those people who gets in their feelings about the next segment, you might wanna chill out and touch yourself. Let me remind you that for the rest of the month, you can get 50% off the Beducated yearly pass with my coupon code ELEXIS. You can try all Beducated courses, and there are over a hundred of them for one day free. Do you wanna ramp up your solo sex, get better with a partner, or do you wanna pick up a new skill like strip tease? Go get Beducated. Remember, you won't get charged for the first 24 hours, and you can cancel anytime. There's no risk because there's a 14 day money back guarantee. Use the link in my description box and celebrate for Masturbation May. Throughout the 
history of competitive dating shows, there have been complaints about black women not being chosen or taken seriously. How important is representation in dating shows? For women who do watch these shows and who are also romantic in their own lives, their desire to be represented is valid. And I think they're fusing with anxieties over modern dating statistics and demographics. If you only get on social media and you're constantly cocooned by images of famous black athletes with white women, passport bros, and romantic divestment girlies declaring they'll find love only with other races, and troubling podcasts and TikTok videos in which people berate black women, things could seem rather dire. And statistics do back up black women's anxieties about desirability and whether or not we are marriage material. According to the Barcelona School of Economics, in 2018, 62% of white women between ages 25 and 54 were married in the US, compared to only 32% of black women. According to the US Census, in 1970, 35.6% of black men and 27.7% of black women were never married, but by 20 20, these percentages had jumped to 51.4% for black men and 47.5% for black women. And overall, 30% of African Americans are married compared to 43% of Hispanics, 52% of whites, and 58% of Asians. Of course, these statistics omit lesbian black women in marriages and long-term partnerships. Plus, not every black woman wants to get married. There's an extensive study by Brookings that found that lower marriage rates aren't hurting black women's mobility. But these aren't the only reasons why the racial marriage gap is so large. Roughly a quarter of black women identify as lesbian or bisexual, meaning approximately three in four are straight. Affecting their chances at marriage if they desire it is the underemployment of black men and mass incarceration. Secondly, men of all races are less likely to propose marriage when they aren't able to afford a wife and family. And let's be very clear that in most cases, marriage is the man decision to initiate. Lastly, a small chunk of the marriage gap can be attributed to black men's intermarriage rate. They're twice as likely to marry outside of their race than black women, with 24% of black married men doing so. I don't subscribe to the belief that black men don't love black women anymore. Why y'all prefer black girls? Uh, shit, that's the culture. That's why I was raised around beautiful black women. During my time in Charlotte, Atlanta, Ohio, and New York, I have always seen black love a lot and it's beautiful. But I'm not blithely naive about the data. More high status black men are dating out, leaving more black women to also date out. So when it comes to straight and bisexual black women's dating choices, we're traversing a minefield. First, many of us are told that we need to pursue marriage and children to enrich our race and keep our population growing so that we remain a sizable portion of the electorate. If we forgo partnership and raise children ourselves, we are painted as destroying the black community by not allowing men to lead a belief that has persisted since Daniel Patrick Moynihan's infamous 1965 report. At the same time, who we decide to marry and procreate with is further held up to scrutiny. If poor black women attempt hypergamy with high status men, defined as highly educated, growing up middle class, etc., they are derided as delusional gold diggers. Meanwhile, middle class black women with degrees who still want black love are told to date down if they want a chance. The Brookings study found that black women tend to create families with black men who do poorly on both individual and family income and thus bring down the family income results for black women. This study is always cited when black women are told to consider dating out in equal numbers to black men. On the occasions when a highly educated black woman dates a felon or someone who makes less money than her and is financially scammed, abused, or even murdered, people say she should have known better. And as explored in We Need to Talk About Black Femicide, black women are approximately 53% of the women murdered by their partners in a year. We can't underestimate how much the decline in marriage is by women rightfully seeing that a guy is trouble and being like, nah, I don't want no parts of it. If a black woman does not want to date down and gets no play from equally matched black men, she dates out and is called a traitor and a wench. And while dating out, her chances of finding love are slimmer than black men and white, Asian, and Latina women who date out from their 
respective races. In addition to the stats about interracial marriage, numerous surveys, polls, and podcasts showcase misogynistic and racist opinions that black women are seen as less desirable than other women by men who are actively seeking marriage. If you don't believe me, they in the comments right now. Them little fingers is just a type and they talking all kinds of shit right now. In 2014, OkCupid's co-founder Christian Rudder found that user data showed that most men on the site rated black women as less attractive than women of other races and ethnicities. Summarized Time Magazine, Asian, Latin, and white men tend to give black women 1 to 1.5 stars less, while black men's ratings of black women are more consistent with their ratings of all races of women. But women who are Asian and Latina receive higher ratings from all men, in some cases even more so than white women. Lastly, colorism plays an undeniable role in black women's marriage possibilities. Dr. Derek Hamilton provided research finding that 55% of light-skinned women were married, while only 23% of dark-skinned women had jumped the broom. He pointed to upwardly mobile black men's tendency to marry light or white as a factor. This is the bleak backdrop for black women who are romantic, looking for marriage with men, and or into dating shows. And that we ain't even talking about like body size and how we wear our hair, all of these things that we're constantly judged on. That's all the backdrop. Tweeted user I am Marie, how does Netflix continue to cast black men who don't prefer to date unambiguous black women on their dating shows? A sentiment I've seen by UK and USA viewers of Love Island, where couples are competing for $100,000. And of course, love is blind. The premise of LIB is like the dating game on steroids, but it's also proof that this type of show really isn't new. Instead of getting to know someone you can't see in front of a studio audience, you spend at least 30 hours in pods with a variety of people before deciding whether or not to commit to a marriage with someone you've never seen. The gimmick is portrayed as being different from any other dating show. Though contestants are predictably plied with alcohol, pushed and prodded by production, and allegedly being denied sleep. Love is Blind premiered in 2020 on Netflix right before the pandemic sequestered most of us into our homes for lockdown, leading to approximately 30 million viewers watching within four weeks of the premiere. Subsequent seasons have garnered record viewership, including the recent season four. Described Julia Jacobs for the New York Times, Kim Kardashian, Lizzo, Billie Eilish, and Daniel Radcliffe are among the show's celebrity fans. And contestants have built gigantic social media followings, with one married participant from season one, Lauren Speed Hamilton, reaching 2.5 million followers on Instagram. Lauren married a white man named Cameron and would later complain about the lack of black women on the show. She tweeted, I don't like how LIB be cutting all the black women. How come they're always in the trailer, but not the show. On the season that I watched for research, one of the season's leads, Kwame Apia, explained why he was ready to join the show and find his wife. He said that he wasn't allowed to go to prom with his girlfriend because he was black, implying that the show was enabling him to fulfill his dream of searching for a white mate without interference. Like so many before him, he coveted a specific race. Jagged hairline aside, herein lies one of the flaws of the Love is Blind social experiment. Because most people can clock the race of the person they're talking to, quickly it becomes evident that Kwame is looking for white women specifically, rather than connecting with who a person is inside. Love is blind my ass. Like, I just want you to be honest about it. Now's a good time to bring up the first black bachelor, Matt James, whose season aired in 2021. Shortly before he was announced, a former bachelor casting director demanded diversity in an open letter. The only black women that were picked to be in the running had weaves or chemically straightened hair, were ethnically ambiguous, or were not considered if they were too black. Women with afros, braids, locks, etc. weren't even given a chance because of the white standards of beauty. So for James's season, a record-breaking 25 women of color plus 12 white women were cast. Of those 25, only eight were unambiguously black. An Instagram account called Bachelor Data tracked which women were getting the most airtime and one-on-one -on -one dates. Unsurprisingly, black women were jilted. As the son of a black father and a white mother, Matt James went on to have two mixed women and a white woman in his final three. The white woman, Rachel Kirkconnell, won. And when the season aired, it was revealed that she was an attendee of plantation balls. Bachelor host Chris Harrison, in a contentious interview with Rachel Lindsay, argued that the racist 
Miss Rachel should be granted understanding, grace, and compassion, leading to his eventual firing. Matt James forgave his Confederate queen and they continued their relationship anyway. As for Rachel Lindsay, the first black bachelorette, she also chose a non-black partner, the Colombian-American Brian Abosolo, who she was clearly in love with from day one. Would Brian have had more competition for Rachel's affections if there had been more eligible black bachelors for the upwardly mobile lawyer? Producers only gave her 10 black men to choose from, and several of them did not date black women. As Rachel would later recall in an interview with Z-Way, I also learned as I was going through my season that several of the black men on my season didn't date black women. The producers thought it would be interesting and intentionally lessen the odds of creating a black love story by offering up a bunch of white men one of whom would later be revealed to liken the NAACP to the KKK. And they called this diversity. The next black bachelorette, Tasha Adams, had six total black contestants, and she also chose a white partner. Will Bachelor Nation ever see a black lead choose a black love interest from a mostly black cast? Do they even want to? Again, 80% of the viewership is white. Would most of those people watch couples that are exclusively black the way they watch exclusively white couples? The answer is no. Interracial couples with one white partner are the profitable and progressive middle ground. This is part of a broader trend of interracial couples rising in media, from the obsession over Bridgerton to all of the mixed couples in ad campaigns. And of course, they represent a growing part of American society. But it's also the easiest way for companies to pretend to be progressive and diverse, while shunting representation of black love and families, which we haven't had much of, to the side. It's also lining up with calls for black women to date out as much as black men do. There's a predominantly black love show on OWN called Ready to Love, which premiered in 2018, and it's geared towards an older crowd. At least one couple has gotten married from the show and a couple of episodes are available on YouTube. The few scenes I saw were interesting and potentially problematic, but I love the representation and the variety of body types and shades of brown. Meanwhile, there is one black couple to root for on Love is Blind. Brett and Tiffany, though some viewers have pointed out that they receive less airtime than other couples, though I think everybody got too much airtime. That show was too fucking long. I kept watching it and I'm just like, when is this gonna end? Eventually, Kwame picked a white woman who was his runner-up choice to another white woman. And for those who've watched the show, it's clear he's putting on for the cameras because Love is Blind fame is proving to be lucrative. But I swear they are so fake, it gives me secondhand embarrassment. Contestants are racking up social media followers, sponsorships, and publicity opportunities. This is the kind of stuff that people who appeared on Blind Date and Love Connection would have loved, but they didn't have the internet on their side. On the flip side, the show, like all reality TV in the social media age, can bring scrutiny and hate. In the contract Love is Blind contestants sign, according to Insider, they acknowledge that being on Love is Blind might destroy their reputations. The contract says appearing on the show may expose information that is personal, private, surprising, defamatory, disparaging, embarrassing, or unfavorable, and open them up to public ridicule, humiliation, or condemnation. Nobody learned this harsh lesson on season four of Love is Blind quite like Marshall Glaze, who was humiliated and called sweet and had his sexuality questioned by his former fiance, Jackie, a Latina and he temporarily had the support of black women when those texts came out. Very quickly, old tweets were dug up from his account in 2014 when he was approximately 19, showcasing his contempt for black women, talking about our lack of a marriage rate, and also his fetishization of Latinas. Shocked! I'm shocked! In this video, we have explored the ways that dating shows have exploited some of our biggest anxieties and controversies. We've also documented the racism and colorism in dating shows that reflects larger beliefs about black women's desirability. I acknowledge my bias as someone who does not date out for my own personal reasons, but I'm not trying to get people to stop watching these shows or trying to convince anybody to divest or date anybody. I'm just observing, clocking, and recording this shit as is. I think that part of the popularity of Love is Blind, in addition to being a lockdown hit, 
is that downward trends in marriage are a source of anxiety. Rush to alter shows like Love is Blind and Married at First Sight can offer a bit of optimism while still providing the hit of dopamine many people have always enjoyed, like in romance novels and movies. In the future, I'm curious to see how anxieties around interracial dating, black women's desirability, feminism, and hypergamy will play out in reality dating shows as the mixed race population in this country continues to grow. It's estimated that the current multiracial population size will triple by 2060. What do you think the dating scene, and by extension, dating shows will be like by then? Let me know in the comments. I think dating shows, along with trad wife creators and alpha male Kevin Samuels s content on social media, will thrive in this decade as our country's population and racial and gender anxieties change. In a backlash to sex positivity, gender fluidity, and more black women refusing to settle, content that reinforces traditional families and black women's subordination will flourish. And because of the increase of mixed race pairs, the media will continue to prioritize mixed couples with a white partner over monoracial minority couples. This might also be reflected in dating shows with more instant marriage formats. Only time will tell. I hope you liked this video. I wanted to do something a little different, do a little rant, talk about a little bit of reality TV. Be sure to keep an eye out for an in-depth video on black women in reality TV soon. And also be sure to like this video and subscribe. And no, black women don't have to lower their standards for anybody.